So welcome to the fortnightly Q&A. Um, this is with Charles Eisenstein. Uh, Charles is the author of A More Beautiful World Our Hearts Know Is Possible. And earlier in the pandemic released this um, amazing article called The Coronation that we, we then had a conversation, I think probably in around May or June, something like that. And that we put out as uh, an epidemic of control. And that film went viral. Um, I'm sorry, I had, to, I had to make that pun. What I love about Charles's work is he really weaves together multiple levels. Like it's got the cultural level there, but it also brings in the mythopoetic and has a very lyrical way of writing and thinking. So I'm very glad that Charles could be with us for this. Charles, before we, we start with the q and I'd just like to, um, I'd like to catch up a little really because we talked around the time of the coronation, the epidemic of control piece, and then we talked again around conspiracies. And I know conspiracy thinking had been kind of dominating your thinking probably I'd say mid mid to late summer, as it as it had for many of us who were kind of watching the the sense making, uh, the sort of progress of sense making through the, the pandemic. Um, I'd love to hear now, sort of maybe four or five months on, where your thinking is at. Like, what's most salient for you now? Do you feel like um, things have settled down? Are you concerned more about getting people sort of getting back to normal? Do you feel that any of the shifts that you were talking about earlier in the pandemic are coming to pass? What's 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 in your kind of front of your thinking right now? Uh, you, the, the way I would answer that question probably changes uh, daily or at least weekly. Uh, I've definitely gone through a lot of... of uh, uh, phases, um, including some pretty deep despair. And then other times where I'm like, what was I so worried about? Everything's going to be fine. Um, but I think that that the basic trends that I uh, explored in the coronation and the conspiracy myth are still uh, progressing to this day. Um, and, and I don't know how many people are familiar uh, with the conspiracy theme. Um, it's not that I am uh, positing a, a conspiracy that runs the world. However, a lot of the things that get ignored uh, and dismissed uh, as being conspiracy theory uh, include things that just don't uh, concord with what we call consensus reality. Things that violate what society in general agrees as agrees upon as being real and um, important and possible even. Uh, so, so as a way to keep out uh, invasive data points, the conspiracy meme uh, that labels things as a conspiracy has been very effective uh, and has been systematized to a large extent, which maybe has the advantage of keeping out uh, dangerous disinformation, but it also keeps out anything that might challenge the status quo. And as these mechanisms get uh, more and more effective, and I'm not saying that there's like some evil cabal that designs and implements these mecha mechanisms on purpose, that would actually be less alarming than if they emerge um, organically from the matrix which I think is a more accurate understanding of what's going on. In any event, uh, the, the, because they have become systematized and more and more integrated into technology, um, I, th this is the, the source of some of my, my despair. I'm like, how are we ever going to build a world on the uh, excised, uh, the banished, the marginalized information that is actually true. Um, how are we ever going to have ever going to to avert the collision course with reality that we are on right now? So that's that's a little bit of it. Um, I I looked at the questions uh, just a few minutes ago, and there's a lot a lot there that I'm looking forward to talking about. So maybe. Um, 
maybe we, we sh- unless you have another thing on your mind, maybe we should dive into those. Well, we'll start with a question from Adriana. Adriana, if you'd like to unmute yourself and... Um, yes, yeah, so you're touching on it already. Hi, Charles. So nice, Hi. really nice being here with you. Um, so I guess the part of your thread, the part of what you represent that feels really close to my heart is um, exactly what you're speaking to. But um, in, in kind of paraphrasing Marion Woodman, she, she says about the yin being in service of the yang. So in service of the invisible. And I see you doing that quite a lot. And I don't know a lot about your work. There are lots of things about your work that I'm not aware of, but I see, I've listened to your podcast a few times and I was um, astounded by you giving voice to, to people or themes that would be marginalized. They would be laughed or, or maybe even ridiculed in some contexts. And, um, I just, I just love that you give not only credibility, but you, you, um, you embrace that and you see that as, as a valid part of truth. So I guess my question from that is, because I, I, I relate to that in a microcosm, in, a micro, in my microcosm, I relate to that bridging and it feels sometimes really tiring and disheartening to me. So I guess the question, and beautiful, and, and my question to you is, how did it arise for you? When did you start spotting um, what was missing and not what was there? And and also um, if you feel disheartened or if you feel um, excited. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I remember reading your question. You also, you talked about other ways of knowing and feminine ways of knowing and bringing them into the table. Um, and, and just now you mentioned uh, yin being in service to yang. I think it's actually more like yang being in service to yin. Oh, so I made, I made a mistake. That's what I wanted to say. Sorry. Ah, was, okay. Sorry. It's yeah. yang being in service of, to yin. Right. Yeah. Right. Or the masculine yeah. being in service to the feminine. The, yeah. Yes. So, so, yeah, for me, it comes from uh, the, so, you know, to, to, so I'm a man. Okay. I'm, you know, in a certain way, masculine. Uh, and we could talk all about, these archetypes and how they are evolving and where they come from, et cetera, et cetera. That's a whole other conversation. Uh, but I, I really appreciate a, a friend of mine, uh, Pat McCabe. She's an indigenous woman here who, who talks about um, the function of the masculine as essentially to uh, serve the life bringer, life bearer of the feminine and, the, and, and how it needs direction from the feminine in order to know what to do. It needs, in other words, grounding in, in the mother, in matter, in materiality, in nature, in life, so that the gifts of the, the, these young gifts of abstraction, of linear thinking, of goal orientation, let's get it done, um, especially the gift of abstraction, they can serve a useful purpose when they become dissociated from that that reality, from life. Then they spin off into these disconnected and ultimately really harmful places, uh, exemplified by the hedge fund, which is, I mean, most hedge fund people are masculine. The whole thing is hyper-masculine. And it is this gigantic numbers game, totally disconnected from service to life. So it's it's what happens when the masculine gift runs amok. So, uh, you know, at some point, and of course, like uh, all of us embody both masculine and feminine qualities. Um, but seeing the, um, the, 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 uh, disconnection. I mean, this has been a theme of my work for a long time, that that um, our gifts have run amok. They've lost their, their purpose, or we have not yet discovered the purpose of our fundamental gifts, of uh, our cognitive and manipulative gifts. And they obviously, the way that they've played out has not been in service to life on earth. Uh, which is really our purpose, like the purpose of every species here is to serve life and beauty on earth. That is why we are here. 
every species adds to the livingness of Earth. And we are not an exception to that. So this, and, and many people sense the necessity to bring uh, uh, the feminine back into the circle of, of power, of decision-making, of our collective choices. And th that does not mean, however, simply to bring women into the positions that men have traditionally held. Um, because the very nature of that position is already masculine by definition. And it's certainly not about the marginalized fighting for a seat at the table. Because when that happens, who do you end up with at the table? You end up with the kind of people who fight for a seat at the table. So I think that for me, it's like, it's the recognition, uh, and this is how, how I came to it, the recognition that I'm lost. And uh, which, which motivates me to go seek my source again. Uh, and to go to those who would never contend for a seat at the table, but who are there waiting to be asked this is not only the feminine inside and outside myself, but it is uh, the, the beings of nature that indigenous people are uh, often in communication with that will not, um, they're not going to interrupt. They're not gonna raise their hand and demand that we listen to them. Uh, they, they are, but they are waiting to be accessed and they're always ready. And when we access them and we, we bring them into the, the table, uh, into the circle, we have um, creative powers that actually far outstrip the dissociative masculine yang creative powers. We, th there are some things we cannot do as well, but, there are, but those aren't the things that we really need right now. The things that we really need right now are basically in a word, miracle level healing. And that comes not through uh, intensifying and perfecting our means of domination over materiality, which is the technological dream. This is the, the um, transhumanist techno-utopian dream that we will attain paradise through more and more precise and forceful control over material reality. Ultimate, boy, this answer is going on a really long time. I know there's a lot of questions, but I'll try to, I'll try to close the loop here soon. Um, that that this view of, of of paradise that that kind of thinks that if we could only control every nanoparticle, every if we could convert everything in the world into data, label every single thing. Uh, and bring it into one gigantic database uh, and, and manipulate it exactly as we desire. Even our brain chemistry, even if we could manipulate our neurons so that only the pleasure centers fire, we could engineer suffering out of existence. If we could control the action of every human being at all times, monitor and surveil everything, uh, then we could create a perfect society. And if we could manipulate every atom of matter outside of ourselves, we could solve every problem, uh, heal the world and create a better earth. That is the aspiration of the uh, dis dissociated technological mind. However, our experience now is, is reminding us or, or making it more and more blatantly clear, I would say, that this dream is um, a hallucination, that it's always on the horizon. Technological utopia is always on the horizon. And the faster we race to reach it, the more exhausted we become, even as it remains as distant as it ever has been. The end of suffering is as distant, if not more distant, than it ever has been. So this is, uh, in a nutshell, this is what has motivated me to, to, to stop and say, hold on here, something else is needed. This exhaustive race to the horizon cannot continue. It's not getting me anywhere. 
I mean, it can continue until everything, every, until all life and beauty on earth is exhausted, but it will never, will never get there. It's like chasing a rainbow. So the, so, so when we stop, when we pause, when we look around us, instead of chasing the rainbow at the horizon, we're able to see the beauty that's already here to realize that we're already at the horizon of something. And then we can choose what direction we're gonna go and how we're going to apply the incredible gifts of science and technology, which are not useless, they're not mistakes. They are, they are core to our humanity. And, and, and we just need to, to devote them to the service of life and beauty, that's it. So uh, yeah, I could say more, but thank you for uh, sparking that, that rant there. Thank you for um, yeah for answering. I feel really moved by your share, and I actually I love the fact that you are, are a man and you bring words to that so eloquently because it's needed and these voices are heard. And I've noticed myself quoting you to thoughts that have had come to me too, but because I knew that in some contexts you're more credible, and and that's that's okay. <laughs> that's still how the game it is, and 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 I love that. So thank you. I appreciate your work. Thanks, Adriana. Yeah, just before we come to uh, Richard's question, it's going to, uh, something that just came up for me that follows on from your thoughts just there, Charles, is a lot of us who have kind of been thinking along similar lines have seen the pandemic as a, as a potential accelerator for this sense of a, of a system running out and this kind of need for something different that you just spoke so eloquently about. Are you still hopeful that that could be the case? Do you feel that it's too early or are you less hopeful than maybe you were when we spoke a few months ago? Well, you know, it's not that the pandemic is going to uh, rescue us from our stuckness in the story of separation in the program of control and domination. What it does, and this, this is what I've thought, you know, since the beginning, um, what it does is it shows us in stark detail where we are headed, what society is going to look like um, when we uh, implement control in more and more domains of life, uh, when every communication is mediated by technology, for example, uh, when the, the uh, non-digitized, non-quantized life of the flesh is um, eliminated, um, when everything is optimized and controlled by, by machines. Like we're, sh we're being shown what life will look like in perfect control, in perfect uh, uh, insulation from, from uh, disease. Uh, the, the, the idea of like, this is one of the basic um, paradigms of control, which is that security, safety, well-being comes through separation. Uh, comes through isolation, through insulation, through maintaining the integrity of the bubble of the separate self. This goes back to the very core of modern mythology, the separate self in a world of other. So, okay, now we're being shown the outpicturing of that in the realm of, of physical health, medicine, and what is life going to look like? We're being shown that. And by being shown it, we're being asked to consciously choose something that had been kind of just an unconscious trend because it wasn't just with COVID that life started to move online, that education started to move online, that dating, uh, so socializing was moving online. You know, people would talk about, I remember in the early 2000s, uh, a student telling me, yeah, you know, in my freshman year, everybody in the whole floor of the dormitory knew each other. We were always visiting each other. We knew everybody's name. By my senior year, nobody knew each other because we were online all the time. So this is, you know, 15 years ago that, that, that this was happening. So we're just being, COVID has just stimulated uh, a further step into that world. And if I have any hope at all, it's that 
we're going to gradually realize through this prevision of what I think is a dystopian future, we're going to realize, you know, maybe we don't really want this. Um, right now, people are still frightened. Um, and that's a whole, you know, this is a whole other complex topic. Uh, and, and and another one in which I'm, uh, you know, not at home in any of the established polarized sides of this conversation, because I don't think that, you know, it's a fake demic or a scam demic or something like that. I think that there's, there's a real disease and people are actually getting sick uh, and, and it's serious. And um, that we have, pit, we have shoehorned this phenomenon into some very narrow and obsolete categories of understanding that will uh, dictate uh, a set of responses that will lead us farther and farther down the rabbit hole of totalitarian control um, and ignoring you know, ignoring like the last 40 years of progress in alternative medicine, for example. So anyway, that's a whole, I, I don't want to be like, oh, you know, people, I don't, it's a, it's a plandemic, a scamdemic, a case-demic, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's something real going on. And this speaks to one of the other questions on that list. Um, the, the archetype that best describes this is the archetype of hysteria. But that doesn't mean that there's nothing to be afraid of. And I could talk about that more, but um, but maybe if maybe we can uh, go into uh, the, the other question that you had prepared. Yeah, so I've got Richard's name against this question, but I don't see any Richards here. Do you want to... If you are here, if you'd like to unmute yourself, if not, I will ask the question. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if you know much about this, Charles. It, um, the Great Reset, the question, it's been upvoted by about four people. So uh, single, though perhaps wide ranging question. What is your perspective on the Great Reset meme? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh I mean, that is definitely a term that has archetypal connotations and could mean many different things. Um, on the one hand, it is it refers to um, the consolidation of the power of the global financial elite uh, to wipe out any residual resistance to their control of the financial system and the economy and politics. Um, and on another level, you could understand it to be um, a wiping away of entrenched economic inequality. So it's a it's a potent concept that can be uh, hijacked and deployed by people with very very different agendas. And and you know the the danger is you know that we build some really beautiful vision around the concept and then somebody else uses that name uh, to wreck harm in the world um because I, I you know what i would like it to mean is uh would start with debt cancellation on a massive scale uh, starting with third world debt uh, which is the underpinning of the global extractive machine uh the global imperialist machine it it, it is founded on uh, debt that is enforced coercively on nations and also on individuals. I mean, what inequality is, the, the intensifying inequality of our world, ultimately it comes down to debt because one person's asset is another person's debt by definition. So a great reset would could correspond to a, a jubilee, to a, a forgiving of the debts, a release of the debts on some level. Uh, and the mechanics of that are a more technical discussion. Uh, but the basic idea of, of, um, of release, of forgiveness, of not holding on to a kind of power over each other, uh, 
uh, I think we all know that a, a more beautiful world has to include a letting go. So, so that's what I want a great, a great reset to be, rather than the wiping away of uh, individual sovereignty, of community sovereignty. Uh, I mean, this, this, you know, on on the libertarian right, that's where most of the uh, criticism of the great reset is coming, and but but their framing of it is around the destruction of national sovereignty and individual sovereignty. For example, uh, the the wiping out of small business so that either you are uh, a super billionaire or you are abjectly dependent on centralized institutions for your monthly pittance so that you can live your online life. Uh, But there's a level missing in between that, which is the traditional level of community, uh, of, of relationship that this is one of the things that I want to bring into the conversation, but but a, the kind of great reset that the libertarian right is criticizing not only uh, extinguishes individual sovereignty, it also destroys community sovereignty, and it puts all the power in the hands of transnational corporations and the, and the, the transnational corporate government complex. We can't really distinguish so much anymore between the private sector and the public sector. So, you know, I guess it comes down to who is doing the resetting. Where is that? Where is where are those decisions being made? Where is the power coming from? And right now, it doesn't look like it's coming from the grassroots. So uh, at this point, I'm quite skeptical that a great reset is going to uh, change anything in a good way. Now, I wonder if anyone uh, in the session is sort of familiar with that phrase and what what it maybe means to them. If people want to sort of just say in the in the chat, because I've seen it sort of spreading quite a bit recently, and not not really entirely sure myself what it what it means. Um, so for the, for the next question, Basil, are you, are you here? Would you like to unmute yourself and ask a question? Basil? Where's Basil gone? He was here because he messaged me before, but. I'm here. Ah, there you are. Okay. Hi. Uh, hello. Um, just bear with me. This question is a fairly long one, but um, interesting, I guess. Right. So it starts with a quote um, by, from uh, Carl Jung. Everyone carries a shadow, and the less it is embodied in the individual's, con- individual's conscious life, the blacker and denser it is. If it is repressed and isolated from consciousness, it never gets corrected. And that's from Carl Jung. So the context here is that with a challenging world environment we all have to navigate, sometimes our shadows emerge. Sometimes these shadows, if left unmanaged, become what I tend to call our pitch black. And my awareness of the aforementioned um, has inspired me to occasionally ask myself, if I don't deal with the shadow, how can I deal with the pitch black? So mm-hmm. on to my question. So from your perspective, what are some of the ways we can explore and manage our shadows so we can deal with our pitch black? <sighs> okay. Well, thank you for quoting Carl Jung. I've been, he's been on my mind a lot these days. Um, so I think anyone who's familiar with the concept of shadow understands that the things that we uh, repress, the parts of ourselves that we are unwilling to see or cannot see, it's not like they just go away and leave us alone, but they make themselves known in uncontrolled, unpredictable ways that look like perhaps that something is happening to us because we have um, exiled them from the from our conscious self, 
So they're 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 operating in the dark, and then they they um, create uh, situations. It could be that they come out as as impulse, like what we repress, it just squeezes out the edges. It comes out in some other way. So in order to learn about our shadow, um, for one thing, you know, we can look at the things that we do that we never intended to do. Look at the times where it feels like something just takes over. And also, um, for me, there's, when there's something unintegrated operating within me. It doesn't necessarily manifest as a dramatic self-sabotage or a big messy crisis. It can also come out as a kind of a, of a, of a ennui, a laziness, a, 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 a discontent, a paralysis where where I think that I know what I want to do, but somehow I can't get around to doing it. I can't make myself do it. I can't focus on it. That's because there's an inner conflict. And eventually this feeling of paralysis and discomfort becomes so intense. In fact, the paralysis is, um, it's doing me a favor. It's It's actually a spirit saying, stop, look within, know yourself. Uh, give attention to that which is which has languished uh, in ignorance, and um, that for me, it, then you know, the, the to to let go, to pause my ambition, my productivity, and take the time to go in and listen to the things that I have not been listening to and the people that I have not been listening to, the parts of myself that I have not been listening to, um, that brings light to the shadow. Now, certainly there's all kinds of, of therapeutic modalities <clears throat> that can help in this process. You know, I have a, um, a guy I work with who's an empath and, you know, tells me, he's like, you're, you're feeling this, you're feeling that, you're feeling that. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you're right, but I wasn't aware of that. So, so I guess I just want to say that that confronting the shadow, it's what we can do on our own is limited. What we can willfully accomplish in terms of seeing the unseen is limited, uh, which makes sense if when we understand ourselves as relational beings. Uh, this is not something that you can necessarily achieve through an act of will. It's something that we can do together uh, when our sincerity, uh, our, our sincere desire to expand our consciousness attracts other people in who can serve the necessary roles for that to happen. When we speak of, so, so this issue of shadow that, that Jung brought into our collective consciousness is intimately connected to what the new age calls raising consciousness or expanding consciousness. What does that actually mean? It's not true that some people are more conscious than others. Consciousness is not something that some people have more, the spiritual elite, and some people, the, the deplorables, wallow in unconsciousness. Everybody is consciousness. The question is, what are you conscious of? So to, to expand consciousness simply means to become conscious of things that you were not conscious of before. These shadow aspects, the things that we're inside ourselves unconscious of, that can be revealed through relationships with other people who share our sincere desire to grow in our consciousness, these correspond to the world, to aspects of the world outside of ourselves. For everything within ourselves that we cannot see, there is something outside ourselves that we cannot see. And this is the, uh, like an extra ingredient to the, um, to the kind of sense-making that, that Daniel Schmachtenberger talks about, uh, where, where we're, we're 
questioning how we know what we think we know and seeking to bring in sources of information that we've excluded and to somehow um, weigh them uh, to figure out which ones are reliable and how reliable and so forth. Um, there's a psychological dimension to that because every new data point that, that uh, disrupts our idea of the world will necessarily also correspond to uh, something that disrupts our view of ourselves. That's the intimate connection between self and world. And so this whole issue of sense-making that I know that, that you've explored a lot on this podcast is, is so inseparable. It's inextricably linked to the inner sense-making, to the expansion of our senses, our senses of ourselves. And so here's the link uh, that unifies uh, and, and in a larger sense makes sense of the revolution that is being offered to us in these times that we can participate in. It is equally a systemic revolution and an inner revolution. And here's the missing piece, <laughs> the, a relational revolution, a community revolution. It's to come into our, uh, to, to come more fully into our relational selves that have to include other people and other beings. So Kavala, um, you asked three questions here. My sense is that your first question is more in, in, in line with where the, the conversation is at the moment. I think it's a really good one. Okay. Um, hey, Charles. It's awesome to talk to you. Thank you. Um, I have been dedicating myself to this impossible task of trying to map the collective psyche uh, since the pandemic began. And maybe the perspective of someone like you would make this task a little less possible. So I would like to ask you, um, what is the archetype or the archetypal configuration that you see constantly? at the moment please yeah yeah so I, I, I uh, had remembered your question and, and I referenced it a little bit already the archetype of hysteria uh, where you know there's something I just read something about um, uh, asymptomatic transmission uh, and see oh, okay so I read something else it, it, just in the Wall Street Journal about how um, the majority of COVID cases, uh, the, the the medical authorities do not know how people how people got COVID. Like there's like you know X percent that came from a family member, X percent came from an identified you know event that they were at social. But but for over fifty percent of the people, maybe as much as eighty percent of the people, like they were you know wearing their masks, sitting at home, socially distanced, and they got COVID anyway. No one they have no idea how they got COVID. So they, anyway, so that, that's one. So like, I'm probably like you, you know, like looking at all these data points, trying to make sense of it. Um, so here on like, and then for me, it helps to step back from the data points sometimes and look at the phenomenon through the lens of archetype, through the lens of myth. Um, so here we have, so imagine that we are in a totally different culture. And all of a sudden, this idea arises that there is an evil spirit afoot. And if somebody has been tainted with this evil spirit, and they so much as touch another person, then that spirit can be translated to that other person too. And how do you know that somebody has been possessed by the evil spirit? You don't know. It's impossible to tell unless a shaman comes and performs a magic ritual and then informs you that you have this evil spirit. But you don't feel anything. You have to take the shaman's word for it. And then you could transmit the evil spirit to somebody else and they could transmit it to somebody else. And, and no one ever knows about it unless the shaman tells them. Okay, so you translate this to our society. The evil spirit is the the... SARS-CoV-2 virus, the shaman with his divinatory ritual is the medical professional with the uh, uh, PCR test that tells you, oh, you have the evil spirit. 
So everybody believes the shamans who are saying that there's an evil spirit afoot and everybody gets becomes terrified and uh, shuns each other. And, and, and some people actually do uh, display signs of having been possessed by this evil spirit, which could make them sick, which could even kill them. But most people, and this is a tiny percentage of the population, a tiny less than a percent, uh, actually are getting sick in a significant way. Uh, so what are we actually afraid of here? Have we been this afraid of um, you know, autoimmunity, which has affected uh, in this country tens of millions of people? How, are we that afraid of um, you know, uh, uh, addiction? I mean, there's a lot of things that are that are harming life an awful lot that we're not in terror of. We don't alter our lives completely. But here comes along something that really sends everybody into fear. So, so beyond beyond the rational, uh, uh, you know, uh, level beyond beyond what the statistics and, and probabilities justify. We're, we're afraid of this way out of proportion to the actual threat. And that's pretty much the definition of hysteria. So that's one of the archetypes to understand this through, which isn't to say that it is all hysteria or only hysteria, as I said before, like something actually is happening. Now, what exactly is happening? Um, that, you know, is it... Um, can we understand it fully through the standard model of contagion? Uh, or is there, um, are there other uh, medical paradigms to understand it through that might shed more light on it? That would be a whole other conversation. Um, Bioterrain theory and, and uh, the body's response to environmental stressors, like whatever, glyphosate, air pollution, um, uh, microwave radiation, et cetera, the new Starlink satellites that are blanketing the planet in um, microwave radiation. It, like there's a whole universe of hypotheses, shall we say, that offer alternative explanations. But anyway, whether regardless of that, uh, hysteria is is one way to help understand what's going on today. And yeah, uh, another, and then of course there's the whole. In your other question, you mentioned like the totalitarian agenda. Um, it's another way to understand it, and and I think we have to when we operate in the realm of myth um, to resist reifying it and objectifying a certain myth and saying this is what is, but rather to say what does this particular lens illuminate, and what does it. Um, obscure? What, what, what does it distort? What can we see and what can we no longer see through that lens? So I think that, that any of these um, lenses of hysteria, of totalitarian takeover, um, of um, random pandemic that afflicts humanity, that's more the standard one, all of these show us something and don't show us other things. And um, Yeah, and it sounds like I'm sitting on the fence um, and, you know, not committing to one or another. But see, the, whichever one I, I step into, and this is how I do it, I step fully into it and see, see what I can see and see how I feel and see, but hold on here, what doesn't add up from within this lens? And I can say that in any, whether it's the orthodox lens, the totalitarian takeover lens, um, the, the hysteria lens, there's always, for me, data points that just don't fit into that lens. So, yeah, the totalitarian takeover, you know, it's, it's not an agenda uh, of, of takeover in my understanding. It's more of the tilt of civilization toward more and more control, as I described earlier, that that it's an ideology of control that makes puppets of the political authorities. Uh, so the 
conspiracy viewpoint that they are puppets is actually true, but it's not that they're puppets of the evil cabal of Illuminati. It's that they are puppets of an ideology and of a system of a, of a, of a predilection toward control as a solution to any problem. Uh, anyway, I hope that's useful. Um, it's gotten to the point where I'm, I'm, I'm like really cautious uh, about uh, proposing some of these things. Um, for one, because they've, you know, some of these ideas are verboten now and can get you censored. Uh, and also because, you know, like, I'm like, what if I'm wrong and I'm sowing doubt and people are basing their doubt on what I'm saying and becoming careless and, you know, what if I'm wrong? What if it is purely just an infection and I should be adding my voice to the voices of the authorities and urging everybody, wear your mask, keep your distance, stay home, and so on. Um, yeah, and every time I go there, I, um, you know, I'm confronted with anomalies that say, okay, it actually cannot be that simple. So, yeah. Thank you. So before we go to the, the next question from Grace, um, so after the Monday session, Nick and Adriana kindly offered to host an after hours room for an hour. And because there, there seems like there's, there's an awful lot of energy here and there's some such great stuff and it seems appropriate to have an after hours session here as well. So thanks to Adriana and Kim who are going to stay on in this room afterwards. So we're going to go for another 30 minutes in here with Charles, then we'll have a, a short five minute break. Uh, we'll find some music, have a bathroom break, and then come back. And I think it'll be, is it 45 minutes, Adriana? Is that, is that right for you? Yeah, let's do 45 minutes. And whoever wants to go deeper into some of the things. Great. Like yeah, and I, I think we're, this was trialed first last week, and we've done it twice in the live sense-making sessions. But I think it's something we're going to start doing after these sessions as well, because... It's, it, it's great to have the Q&A and, and Charles to be here and answer the questions. And I think it just feels really fitting that we can have a bit of time afterwards to discuss and just to, to share about what, what we heard in the session. So uh, thank you to Adriana and Kim for volunteering. And Grace, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Sure. So yeah, thanks. It's really... Um really a pleasure and honor to have you here. And I've been working on new forms of economy and your book, Sacred Economics, is just tremendously inspirational and, um, you know, one, one helped me a lot form my thoughts around this. And you mentioned there seven different um, solutions to implement um, from what you were saying, a jubilee to demirage, but most of those solutions are still within the realm of monetary and monetary currencies and transactional uh, operations among people. And the beginning of your book is all about like, it doesn't have to be transactional. Like that's not necessarily a natural way of operating. So my, like I kind of had this like, it was kind of like an anticlimax, like it didn't go far enough. And do you envision a post-monetary world, different forms of interaction that aren't transactional in nature and uh, maybe outdating, slowly outdating money as yeah. a form of communication. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what I foresee is a shrinking of the money realm uh, and a corresponding uh, increase, uh, uh, growth of the non-monetary, non-transactional realm. The problem today is that we have a money system that demands and uh, drives endless growth. So more and more of life enters the realm of transaction, the realm of the market, the realm of money, um, crowding out all other kinds of human interaction. Incidentally, COVID, even though everyone's talking about how it's harmed the economy and so forth, COVID actually is feeding, ultimately feeding the growth machine by um, depriving us of of even like, like making us dependent on technology for more functions of our basic humanity, like communication. Like 
we never before had to, to pay to gather, to pay to talk to each other. But now when these are mediated by technology, we have to pay for it. Um, so anyway, ultimately this is, you know, yeah, ultimately COVID is gonna be good for the economy. Uh, at least it's going to, by which I mean, it will increase the realm of paid goods and services. It won't necessarily make that uh, increase in GDP more equitably distributed, quite the opposite. But as far as economic growth goes, ultimately it will help economic growth. You know, Amazon is doing great, for example. Uh, Netflix, you know, fantastic. So, um, and, and you know, Netflix too, like, like one of the human functions that has migrated from the commons, from the non-transactional realm to the transactional realm is entertainment, recreation. People used to get together and sing. Someone would play the piano. Someone would take out a guitar. We would create fun together. And fun now depends on buying a product. And I, I'm overstating the case, but, you see, but we can all see the trend. So, so basically what Sacred Economics is doing, the book, um, it's saying, what is it about the money system, about, about the economy that impels endless growth? How could we change that so that the realm of the market, the realm of transaction can shrink and we can reclaim our humanity from it. And, I, and to answer your question, I don't see necessarily um, a post money world, at least not anytime soon, but I see a much smaller realm of money so that we can reclaim life from money. And maybe there's a realm that always, or for a long time into the future, continues to use money because it requires a global coordination of labor um, and uh, a, a you know, way to, to distribute resources across thousands of different specializations um, on a large scale. If you don't do that with money, you know, some people talk about, oh, well, you know, have resource-based economy and have computer algorithms decide where the resources have to go. And I thought through that and I realized that the data that those algorithms would need um, to judge where demand is and where excitement about a creative venture requiring a mass coordination of creativity, that data ultimately becomes a proxy for money. Uh, the, the way that that data flows. So there's really no escaping it. Uh, there's no escaping the need for some kind of signaling molecule in the social body to direct resources and coordinate activity. Uh, but, but we can, so, you know, to produce microchips or something like that, like maybe we need a money system, but probably not to produce food, entertainment, shelter, uh, like there's so much of life that that has been co-opted by the money realm that that we can reclaim. So, yeah, that's my thoughts on that. Thank awesome. you very much. Yeah, I mean, somebody asked a little bit about the transition from here to there. Um, so I don't know if you want to address that because I saw in the chat that came up as you were speaking. Yeah, that was Oslem's question. Would you like to ask that one, Oslem? Sure. Uh, thank you. Hi, Charles. Uh, I was uh, wondering uh, if uh, you answered to the question earlier that you haven't been feeling very optimistic lately, but can you imagine any a transitional path out of uh, the current state of the civilization? Uh, as I mean, I think a simple review of current uh, global assets and resources uh, and liabilities and responsibilities, I actually uh, didn't write it correctly, distribution of that and allocation of it doesn't afford that type of beauty, life and love uh, to emerge, to be transitioned to, unless it's somehow uh, relinquished uh, by a little uh, few who hold the power to let go and just uh, afford a restart uh, in a yeah. balance. Or uh, as you... Uh, just uh, somehow you just mentioned perhaps like somehow they're forced to do so by a massive grassroots movement perhaps and some sort of cultural 
uh, revolution or enlightenment like Daniel sometimes talks about. But how else to transform wisely uh, where yin could be at service? Because I just thought that uh, a lot of the times the monetary system, I think, is think of it as valuation. Perhaps we can learn to value resources and responsibilities, allocate and distribute them differently. So it's not about just materialistic value, but other types of things could be valued. And the responsibilities could also be allocated beautifully and equitably. So, sorry. Yeah. Long. <laughs> No, it's fine. I mean, there, there's, you know, certainly a lot of plans uh, that one could invent uh, to transition from here to there. Uh, but what's the plan for the plan? Like if I come up with a brilliant blueprint for a more beautiful world and here's how politics should work and here's how money should work and, you know, here's how healthcare should work and here's how education should work. Like, what am I expecting that that I'm going to present it to Donald Trump or to, you know, the heads of all corporations? And they're going to be like, oh, yeah, that's really brilliant. Let's implement that. Like, can they even do that? Their their choices are so locked into the system. They are they, they we think that they have all the power, but they don't. They're highly circumscribed by their institutions by all of their relationships, you know, like the head of a government, he'll be like, yeah, Charles, I love that idea. But if I even implemented one tenth of it, the international bond markets would rebel and our currency would plummet. So sorry, like this is the, this is where we're stuck. Uh, however, like what you say about, about so, so that doesn't mean that there's no role for courage from the power elite uh, because uh, so I think that the, the way I see the transition happening, and this isn't so much of a of a of a plan, but it might give birth to at least some clarity personally about how we might contribute to this transformation. The way I see it happening is, for one thing, uh, our the general public belief in the scaffolding story of our systems uh, hollows out. And this is already happening. We no longer so fervently believe in the ideology behind modernity. So anything that we can do to contribute to that hollowing out uh, is, is, is useful. Uh, because when it comes time to, to exercise people power, there will be fewer internal barriers to that. Won't be like, well, am I sure? You know, do I really want to bring it down? Do I really want something different? This is kind of good. And what, like, like there will be fewer internal barriers. Uh, another thing is is that to know that there's something on the other side of of collapse. There's something on the other side of a, of a reset. Uh, that a more like I this is my my cliche. You know, a more beautiful world is possible. How do we actually know that though? It's not just a fancy idea. One way that we know that is through experiences that emanate from that more beautiful world uh, the, the, that, that touch us with an experience of what human beingness could be, what human relation could be. And this is a, just a fancy way of saying experiences of, of kindness, of unconditional love, of forgiveness, of generosity that emanate from a more beautiful world and help raise our expectations for life and condition us to that future and that uh, then give us the, the, the faith that we need to step across the line, to step across the, across the threshold and ask for this future. And then as far as the elite goes, um, I ask what does it take for them not to hold on so tightly to what they have now? Maybe it's the realization that it's not actually doing them very much good. Certainly they're much better off than the plebes uh, of our society. You know, if you have 
you know, if you're if you're a billionaire and you can have your yacht and your private island, you know, and your private jet and all that stuff, the, your you know, oceanfront mansion and so forth. But is that really what you want? Are you really happy? Is that protection against the things that really make a human being miserable, like divorce, like your teenager gets addicted to something, uh, you know, like like disease, um, it, addiction. I mean, this these are not actually happy people. Depression. If you want to find happy people, you know, go to a Caro village in 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 Peru. You know, go to a. a, a a Hadza settlement in, in, um, where, where, where are they? In, uh, uh, West Africa. I can't remember where they are. Anyway, like you go to, you know, go to Senegal, you know, go to like places where people still live in community, where Steve, people still have a sense of place. And, and we can, yeah, I mean, this isn't a plan, but it is an orientation. I, I was just uh, in conversation with uh, Fritzi Horst, 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 Horstfeld. Uh, she, I can't remember her last name. Um, she does. I'm going to do a podcast with her soon because she does this work in prisons. Uh, this uh, um, her film is called "Step Into the Circle." It's a short film, and and she's like helping these men release themselves from shame and from self judgment. Uh, and like this profound healing that's happening. If that doesn't happen, then there is no more beautiful world possible. We have to, we can't, we can't hope that it's going to change from the top, that, that the system is going to change without a corresponding change, without a corresponding healing in every member of society which doesn't mean that we ignore systems change and only work on our personal healing, only do work in the prisons, only do work in the slums, only do work uh, with the traumatized and so forth. But it means that when you're orienting toward what is your work, that to, uh, to, to, to valorize that work as much as any political work, to realize that, that the, um, elements, like the atoms of society, the human beings that are, that, that their state ultimately is expressed is, as the global state. So, because, you know, for a lot of, a lot of people, there's this lingering sense of futility that no matter how much work I do in my little realm, what does it matter? when the whole system is careening toward catastrophe. Well, the reason that the system is careening towards ca catastrophe is that this healing on a mass level has not happened. So I want to just liberate, to like offer permission in a sense, uh, and to myself too. I mean, this the reason I'm so familiar with that voice of futility is that it's speaking to me every day. So I want to, to liberate that uh, and and put it into a bigger picture of global revolution. Not exactly a plan, but when I'm in the truth of that, I do not feel pessimistic. It's not too late right now. Yeah. Thank you. Kim Maynard, your, your question kind of links on from this, if you'd like to ask it. Yeah. Hi, Charles. Good to see you. Hi, Kim. Um, there's this tendency to, for, for you know, we're, we're living in this chaotic time, and you speak to this, that we just, we just want some certainty. We just want something. So a plan, you know, and I remember, you know, years ago we used to talk about hospicing the old and picking up the new and all oh, that sounded great and this this idea of just sort of wanting something that we can sink our teeth into and and say yes that's what we're going to do 
has the, the, the same content as the linear thinking that we're already kind of stuck in. So the idea of living in the unknown, which you know we all are talking about, being in the unknown and feeling like we don't know, um, not that we don't just have a plan, but we don't even have like a sense of what, what it should look like. And then we get, we get into this, okay, well, let's just stay in nothing. Let's just say, we don't know anything. Let's just hang out. And I'm just wondering if you can talk to that because there's the, a lot of the thought on complexity thinking brings out the influencing of the influencing of the influencing, which feels more real. It feels like that's how things are actually changing. So I just wondered if you could um, speak to that. Yeah. The sense of bewilderment that uh, is afflicting a lot of people right now is an improvement over the certainty that comes from thinking that you understand what to do uh, when you maybe don't understand what to do, especially when the solution templates that you're familiar with are in fact part of the problem. Primary among these is the solution template of find something to control, find something to, to dominate and it solves the problem. So, so this um, unknowing uh, is a phase, it's a stage, but it's not something to permanently stay in because when we step into that, then we're able to see the shadow. Uh, we're able to see things that were not visible when we were locked into the holding pattern of maintaining and intensifying normal. So from that in-between stage, the, the new perceptions, the new information can come in um, that allow us to make plans, allow us to see, and even if it's not a plan, at least it is a vision or a story about what could be that assigns a role to ourselves. Uh, and and hmm. because the, the planning, that is a, a, a yang function uh, that 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 can be applied in any direction. So if we but but when it feels futile, uh, and it feels like it's helplessly taking us in a direction we don't want to go, then it's time to come back to source, uh, and to, and to 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 bring in the excluded information that can allow us to actually make a plan toward a destination that we can now see that we might not even have been able to see before and to access information and capacities that were uh, outside our ken before. Um, you know, and some of this is this, this embrace of maybe it's not, it's not, I can never know for sure, so I'm just going to stay in unknowing. It's the step is maybe what I thought I knew isn't actually true. It's a willingness mm -hmm. to let go of part of the edifice of certainty and of identity. Again, this is a what we would call a spiritual step. Uh, it's not just better, um, better critical thinking. Although, if we we could look at it through that lens too, like to to actually engage in critical thinking requires a surrender of something. It requires a surrender of, yeah, I'm the smart guy who knows the answers. I've been right. You have to be willing to, to let go of being the authority, of being right, of gaining your identity and your approval, self-approval from that, from that place, which means addressing the wound that motivates that acquisition of rightness and authority and expertise to begin with, which is self-rejection, which is a wound almost universal in modern societies. And, and that is uh, intensified through experiences of trauma, uh, especially those that um, are associated with people who loved us or are supposed to love us. So this is you know going all the way to the root. Um, yeah, critical thinking is not only a skill that we can that we need to acquire. Um, it's also a state of being 
of letting go. So, yeah, um, from the the willingness to question what we thought we knew, the new knowledge comes in that can constitute completely unsuspected plans, plans that um, that that you know just were not available to us before. And I know this is all kind of abstract, um, but um, uh, hopefully it's communicating something. Yeah, yeah I can just say, I, I think this kind of level of abstraction is a necessary place to go sometimes in order to like zoom out to how are we actually thinking about this, to coming into you know, doing things in the world. And then how is this actually, yeah, affecting the, the way that we're thinking? I think that kind of is really important, like incremental yeah. knowing, yeah. letting go okay, of knowledge. Yeah. Here, here's, here's, here's the thing. Um, so questioning, oh, did I really know what I thought I knew? Like that is uh, uh, an important step. And there's another thing that goes along with it, which is to, actually own what you do know in in the last few weeks you know I've, I've said i've been going through quite some despair on occasion uh and it came to the point where i began to to doubt and question things not just that i believed but that i knew from direct experience but which contradict what i'm being told from the outside it's like kind of gaslighting you know it's like who are you going to believe charles what I am telling you or your own lying eyes. And, and like, I was like, like um, getting into this really uh, pathological self self doubt where I didn't dare stand for what I actually know from direct experience. So there's a source of truth that does not depend on what people are telling you, what the media is telling you, what social media is telling you that we can plug into. This is an example of the other ways of knowing that Adriana was, was referring to at the beginning. Uh, and, and in our current information environment with the narrative warfare and the, the you know, all of the, the spin and disinformation and fake news and fake fake news and so forth, like how do we orient if we do not have some other source of knowledge? that ultimately resides in the body and in our direct experiences and to trust that. So this, like, this trap of staying in the unknowing and I can never know anything, is that actually true that you can never really know anything? No. Uh, and, and so if you do feel stuck in that state and unwilling to enter the masculine, to make the plans, to go for the goal, to step into the world, then there's another thing to look at. Why, why, why am I afraid to step out? Um, how am I, what am I doubting that's real? Um, and yeah, there's more shadow than to, to be discovered there. Um, you know, for me, it's like, you know, part of my shadow is my desire to please everybody. Um, you know, the desire for the approval of whoever I've, installed as the parent figure, um, the desire to avoid conflict. Uh, like there's, there's various semi-conscious programs running that I can work with and bring into consciousness so that I can uh, be free of them and, and uh, step into uh, and act on what I actually know and not use as an excuse, well, I can't really know anything. So, so this body function of recognizing the truth is different from the feeling of truthiness when you encounter something that, <clears throat> that fits in with everything else that you think you know and, and makes you feel good uh, and, and validates you and demonstrates that you've been right all along and that you're on team good. Like this is what people mistake for intuition but it is not the same as the recognition of truth. The recognition of truth, an example of that is you hear a story from somebody and you just have no doubt that that, that is their true experience. 
like like in this this film um, about the prisons, you know, like here's a man talking and and a truth lands there. And you can no longer think that, oh, everybody in prison is just a lousy criminal. Like you, you know something that is communicated in the body and often actually disrupts what you would like to believe and what would validate your rightness. Like this openness to the world that, that, that goes beneath the mental defenses. This is something we have to learn to trust. And our opportunity to trust that is uh, especially available when the whirlwind of conflicting narratives and information becomes so confusing that we just have to shut it out sometimes. And, and, and we just recognize at that moment, we have to source truth from somewhere else, which doesn't mean that we only like, it doesn't mean that you just look within for all information. But when we're grounded in, in direct experiential body-based information, we have a, uh, a new organizing principle uh, to, to help us make sense of the whirlwind. Yeah, to say thank you to Charles for that. Uh, beautiful sharing. I really felt, and I think everyone felt you get on a real flow during many of those answers. So thank you for, for being here and inquiring so honestly and so deeply. Mm. Yeah, I really appreciate this forum, David. Um, and, you know, just what you bring to it, uh, your, you know, kind of mainstream journalistic background and the, and the uh, tools that you bring to bear from that, but combined with your openness to, um, to radical ideas uh, and and you know the things that have been marginalized and excluded uh, without like jumping into any of those narratives either, but to really like to you, you know you really do epitomize the um, authentic spirit of journalism, I think, which is one of the uh, threatened forms. You know, it's one of our society's main sources of knowledge: journalism, science, philosophy. Those are the three engines of knowledge production that are so compromised today. So I really, really, I did want to, you know, express that, um, my appreciation for you mm -hmm. holding this forum. Yeah, no, thank you so much for coming. And I think there's already quite a lot of, um, there's already a groundswell in the chat for you to come back. So at some point okay. in the future, we can do this again. All right, well, I've kind of run out of things to say, so, so, uh, but yeah, I would, I would love to come back someday. Rebel Wisdom isn't only about the ideas in the films, it's also about how we bring them into our lives, which is why over the last few months, we've invested in developing the Rebel Wisdom community, our digital campfire. We've launched a new platform for discussion and connection, started regular meetups and practice sessions for members, plus Q and A's with some of the amazing interviewees we've had on the channel, and our Wisdom Gym, with some of the biggest names in growth and transformation. So if you'd like to support Rebel Wisdom to help us continue to make films and to find the others, maybe think about joining the Rebel Wisdom community. Thank you for watching.